You're good to go, Brad. Okay. <clears throat> On uh, the January 25th, 2021 Forest Grove School District work session is called to order at 535. David, you're up. You bet. So I think we're going to start today with um, a, a session on kind of Measure 98, where we've been, what have we invested in, um, and give the high school kind of an opportunity to talk about kind of next steps and where they're headed with Measure 98. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen, Brian, and Colleen to tell us a little more about Measure 98. All right, as we get going here. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, let's get this up. Is it nice and big now, hopefully? Yeah. Okay, all, all right. right. So, um, so we have a lot of um, information to share with you tonight. It should only take, I don't know, hour and a half or two hours <laughs> or so. Um, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> we scaled this down quite a bit. We presented last March to you guys on Measure 98. So we've got some new stuff to share um, and also some new data, obviously with um, COVID and the shutdown, some of that data um, isn't quite up to date, but um, we're gonna start off with just demonstrating that um, our demographics are constantly changing. And obviously those of you that have been around the district for a while, um, they've been changing for quite a while, but um, our Latino and Hispanic population up close to 56%. Um, that's just up a couple percentage points from last year. Our Caucasian down to 38 and our other has, has jumped up um, quite a bit. Same thing with economically disadvantaged. Last couple of years we've been in the 50s and now we're up close to um, 70%. So um, our ever, ever English language um, up again, a couple percentage points. Um, the rest of them are pretty much the same. Um, and our population has not decreased uh, much this year um, at all. Okay, so this is some of the new stuff um, that you have not seen on Measure 98. So uh, Measure 98, as you know, we've been able to spend money in three different buckets. Um, and um, ODE um, is every two years doing a, um, a like a, an evaluation, right? To, to make sure that you're using the money um, where you should be and that you are seeing the results that you are wanting to see in use of that money. So we actually have um, a virtual site visit with ODE um, this Thursday. And um, those top four areas, teacher collaboration, systems ensuring on-time graduation, practices to reduce chronic absenteeism, and equitable assignment to advanced, advanced coursework, those four areas must be met. And on a four point rubric, we have, to, we have to be in the practicing, which is a three, or in the embedded on the rubric, which is a four. Um, if we don't fall in those areas, then a plan has to be put in place and we need to make sure that we um, are meeting those areas or we do jeopardize loss of Measure 98 funds. So um, we have a high school success team. Um, and um, when we met last time, um, we established these goals um, that we would meet. These are long range goals. So in another year, this is what we would wanna see. 100% of our students leaving ninth grade on track. 90% of students having 90% attendance. And we actually put a due date of um, this coming June. 100% um, of our students taking at least one CTE college or dual credit class by the time they are leaving us. 80% of our PLC meetings will be using data to support student success. Um, this is a, a big one that um, a lot of schools see um, a lot of not only teacher collaboration, but um, interventions identified for students that are at risk or struggling. Um, and so the use of PLC meetings um, is a big um, avenue to really um, fine tuning our instructional practices and looking at data. And then our fifth goal is 88% graduation rate. And we wanted to see an increase of 10% in special ed and our um, subgroups. 
Um, our subgroups, as you guys know, um, are the ones that we, we typically struggle with. So those were goals that we set a year and a half ago. These are the areas that we have spent money. Um, and a lot of this is staffing. Um, on this page, it is primarily all staffing. So, um, you know, when we first started out, we increased our CTE classes, basically by taking our part-time people and making them full-time. And since then, um, we've hired a business teacher um, and expanded our computer science program. Um, we've done um, an extra counselor, an extra admin, math TOSA, um, a Calc IA, a family um, outreach, um, Calc counselor, mental health care coordinator, a math intervention specialist, um, mechatronics, um, freshman success. Um, so um, obviously, you know, if we put money into staffing, then that's that's a long-term commitment, right? Unless you're gonna um, remove that person from um, the, the staffing. But um, once we dedicate the money to staffing, it's gonna be there for a long-term. Um, and so we tried to be strategic in putting some towards staffing to start with and then doing some of our facility improvements in the other. So we did quite a bit and you guys already heard that last year. We did a, quite a bit in the round of um, just bringing our um, our classrooms in CTE up to industry standard. Okay, so ninth grade on track is a big goal of Measure 98, and so this 100% of students will leave ninth grade on track is um, is a huge focus because um, students that are on track at the end of ninth grade are three times more likely to graduate on time. To be on track, they have to have six credits. Um, by the end of their freshman year. And, um, and so these are all the things that we have done um, or added positions we've added um, over the course of the last two years. We have added a counseling position. We have a family outreach attendance, um, an administrator. We have a ninth grade success team that is working to, with um, North, Northwest Regional ESD. Um, these are data-driven meetings. We meet regularly um, with the ninth grade success teams at Northwest Regional um, at least once per um, every six to eight weeks. Um, we've got our data teams meeting on a regular basis um, at least every six weeks. Our freshman success team is meeting two times per month. We've got AVID at the ninth grade. Um, we have a mental health care coordinator that's really supporting our ninth graders. Um, we've got after school academic support. We have um, a homework club happening and summer school options for some of those um, some of those ninth graders as well. We've been really working on this goal consistently for the past three years um, and you're going to see that on this slide. So you can see um, our trend data over the last um, three years and we've got some preliminary data for this um, past most recent year. Um, unfortunately Unfortunately, because of COVID, um, ODE is not reporting ninth grade on track data. So these are numbers um, on that far right hand column um, from Synergy, which is what is reported to ODE, but ODE is not officially reporting this data. Um, you can see that in 2016-17, our data was pretty rough. In 2017-18, we joined the Northwest Regional ESD Consortium and implemented some strong data teams. We used Measure 98 funds to add support personnel as well. And we've had a strong return on that investment over the last three years. You can see overall from 2016-17 to 2018-19, um, we went from 75% of students being on track by the end of their ninth grade year to 85%. Um, I believe that we were on track this last year to also meet at the very least or exceed that 2018-19 number prior to COVID. Um, at semester one, we were hovering right around 85%. Um, COVID did impact um, grade nine pretty uh, negatively, and we quickly scrambled to continue the supports we had in place during in-person, but ultimately our percentage dropped a bit. Um, however, you can see that we have really um, impacted a lot of those subpopulations that Karen was referring to. Um, our economic economically disadvantaged students went from 66% to 81%. That's a huge increase. We went from 60% to 79% with students with disabilities. Um, we've just had some incredible growth. Our ELLs, 51% to 75%. So we are really excited to continue this work. Um, and we're really excited to see what our um, data was gonna look like last year um, and, then, and then COVID. Um, okay, so Aaron and uh, oh, sorry, this um, is team, a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
quick question. If the board members have questions. Do you want to take them in the um, presentation or at the end? I'm good either way, honestly. Am I, are you losing me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, do you want to take questions as we go or at the end? Um, we can take them as we go. Okay, great. There's, I just know a couple of the board members may have some questions. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah. And then Brian, is this you? Yep. So goal two of Measure 98 was to that 90% of our students would have 90% attendance by the end of this school year. Um, and the Measure 98 additions that we added to try and reach this goal would be the attendance family outreach, hire a classified position. Um, that member serves on our attendance team and that's headed by our Dean of Students and they're, they're doing an outstanding job over this whole school shutdown. We can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, also just student supports for academic, social, and emotional. We hired an additional counselor and additional administrator and part of their duties is to help in those interventions for attendance and academics. And then our new position this year is the mental health care coordinator. And she's already had 89 referrals uh, sent her way this year. And of, of those 89 referrals, 45% of those students are in that critical risk for attendance, which means they're below 90%. Ryan, this is Marcia, I have a question. Okay. Um, or for uh, Karen, based on the few slides that you have shown, um, and you've talked about you know, this measure 98 and the allocation of staff, what percentage of the staff that you have hired to do this prevention work um, are actually populations of color? So are they, um, are we closing the disparity of the um, students of color versus the uh, staff that are being hired? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and if we um, take a look at between the CTE um, and um, attendance outreach. So I would say of color, I'm looking at my list here. Um, we have hired one, two, three, four, five staff of color um, within those positions. Out of how many? Um, out of 12. And some of those are, are part-time. So some of them, some of them were like an uh, like a 0.3 or a 0.5, but we're looking at about 12 staff. And just another quick question: Are they um, are they classified staff or are they um, teachers or? Um, it's both. We hired two classified um, staff and then um, and then three licensed. The reason no, I, I'm sorry, three classified, two licensed, sorry. Okay, uh, the reason I ask is because, you know, as we, I assume this needs to be reported to the state that we're showing that we're trying to close that disparity of actually having um, personnel that reflects the underrepresented populations we're serving. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, here's the, the data on our um, regular attenders. To be a regular attender, you need to attend 90% of the time. Below 90% is chronic non-attenders. So you can see in 2018-19, we were at the 70% mark. We dropped a bit last year um, and we're holding on to that same 68% mark right now. We are, we're struggling to keep kids attending during um, the, the distance learning but we are, we do have the, that attendance team that's maintaining contact with students every week. They've done home visits, they make phone calls, their, their efforts are very strong in this area. And so we're hoping to continue those family connections. We aren't doing any truancy this year. Um, we're just using our attendance team to go out and reach out to families and see what they need. A lot of times that's just, you know, checking in on what's, what's happening with that family during this time period. It, here's the uh, chronic non-attendance or attendance by grade level. And typically as is in most high schools, the younger grades have better attendance. And as, as you get older, the attendance rate drops for grade levels. You can see those numbers right there. Hey, Brian, can I ask a quick question? Yep. This is Valerie. Um, I was wondering how successful those attendance teams are 
and what they're finding to be the most successful uh, ways of going about bringing up the attendance for the chronic absenteeism? Well, right now, I think their most successful measure is the home visits they're doing. So there's, there's about four people on that team who are, we make calls in the morning to try and reach families who are below 90% attendance or maybe even above 90% and are failing a class. And if they don't make contact, they actually go out to the homes and they have great conversations. Sometimes the families are a little bit taken aback that there's someone come to their house, but outside the house, they don't go inside the house and they maintain social distancing, they have masks, everything. But they, they make great connections with the families. And a lot of times, I think sometimes the families are defensive that they're going to the house, but then once they explain they're there to help and help them with hot spots or troubleshooting canvas, or sometimes it's a food basket, whatever they need is really what they're doing. So this year, I think that's the most, um, that's probably the, the best technique they're using. In the previous, when we were in school, they were dividing up their students who are in that 80 to 89% range who are just on the border. And they were trying to mentor those students and check in and set goals with them. And we saw some pretty good results with, with those programs. Thank you. Um, so you said four people are doing the at-home visits right now. Do they have to pair up or can they go singularly? Okay. Yeah, we, the, our district policy is that they don't go, about, go by themselves. Uh, we just think there's too much of a liability to send someone out by themselves, but they, they ride in separate cars yeah. um, because of the, the social distancing except for one team that has worked so one two, pair of individuals that's worked so long, our district nurse has given them permission to ride um, separate or together in the car, <laughs> front seat, back seat. Um, that's great. <laughs> front yeah. seat, back seat. That's awesome. Um, do you, is that enough people doing these home visits? Are, are people falling through the cracks because you're not able to do as many home visits as you need? I think we're doing okay in the home visits. I think what we are finding is that we need to strengthen the number of people making calls and outreach to homes. Um, and so one of the things we we're talking about is using our advisory assignments to actually take that on. And so a teacher generally has 25 kids assigned to them in their advisory. And what, we're, what we've been talking about this week is using those groups for teachers to actually look at like how is my how are my twenty five kids doing and having those teachers start to make calls on Wednesdays? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Thanks. Yep. So this like kind of piggybacks on what Brian was just talking about with um, with our attendance team. So um, Dwight Jensen and um, and Juan Lopez um, are two of the key people in collecting the data on the attendance team spreadsheet. And unfortunately, I mean, the silver lining in this whole pandemic thing is that we're learning some strategies that we've we've not had to utilize before, you know, like the home visits. Um, and with this data, um, one thing that um, the attendance team is getting really good at, and Brian um, talked about just a minute ago, is um, really taking a look at, so, okay, so you're... Um, your chronic absentee or anything, any kids below 90%, right? So um, how many kids do we have that are just really close? Um, and, um, and then how many kids do we have that are clear down in that 20%, 30% attendance range? And so this just gives you um, the data as of the 22nd of January, um, where um, the number of students basically that are performing or attending in each of those areas. And it gives the, obviously the high school and then Calc separately and then a total. Um, so we do have a, a good chunk of kids, one that, that got perfect attendance um, and we did send some um, recognition home to them, some certificates and stuff. And then a large percentage of kids between um, 90 and 99%. Um, obviously that, you know, the 60 to 89%, we still need to spend some time working. And then this is where we um, really have some at-risk students that we really need to focus in some um, attention and supports. And, and that's where, you know, when we start talking about Lippy, um, you know, that's where we're gonna focus some of our efforts and see if that makes a difference with um, those kids being a little more successful. Karen, if I can just add to yep. some of those numbers at the, at the bottom too, we're not allowed to drop 10 day drop students this year. Uh, with the OD rules around and with COVID. So some of these, some, some students normally would not be on this because they would have, I mean, this isn't great, but they would have dropped by this time. So we have some non-attenders that we continually are trying to reach out to, 
but that's your, your one to 19%. Sometimes your 20 to 29% are those students who are not engaging at all and it, despite like weekly efforts, so. Good point, very good point. So how, this is Brad, I got a question. I don't know, Brian or Karen, either way. Um, so how do you define attendance? So if you, if you, if you have somebody log into a class and then log out again, I mean, it, how, how, I'm sure there's a definition for attendance in terms of online learning. Yeah, there's, there's asynchronous attendance and there's, a, there's regular attendance. And asynchronous is what you just described where a kid maybe logged in but did not stay the whole time or um, th that person didn't attend the whole class and they're marked asynchronous, meaning they, they were, which was what the state has defined it as. They, they didn't attend the whole time but they made contact to the, the teacher on that day. So we, we have those coded and our attendance team actually will make calls to parents and families who have kids who start to have multiple asynchronous absences. Okay, thanks. Yep, we do have some kids who are purposely asynchronous. We have an asynchronous agreement that we, where we meet with a family, the kid might not be able to attend a certain, especially like a first and second block because they're maybe the oldest in their house and they're trying to help their younger siblings navigate their classes. And so they may have a class where the family and the school has agreed that they're, they're not gonna attend the class live, but they're gonna watch a recorded uh, session and attend and, and it's Canvas tracks that when they watch that, so. Thanks, Brian. Yep. So then our, our goal three, um, and this, this encompasses um, many areas, not only um, CTE, but also our dual credit classes that could be through Willamette Promise, um, PCC, but also AP classes. And so here we've got some of the strategies we've utilized, um, obviously increasing the number of classes um, and really supporting the pathways. Um, and then uh, the college level classes that's included as far as um, financial um, staffing and then updating our facilities to industry standards. So culinary metals, um, cabinet shop, wood shop, uh, mechatronics, all of that increase the number of students accessing college level classes. Um, so providing support. So AVID's a big piece of that, Juntos, um, the math and English support, AP recruitment, um, recruiting students into AP um, and giving them the supports they need to be successful. And then working with middle school on the promotion of all of our courses and our career pathways and um, continue to, continuing to expand those pathways. And then possible um, systematic implementation of ninth grade transition classes. So we've had a summer school for a number of years, but we also need to be a lot more intentional um, as we continue to invest Measure 98 funds into the ninth grade and really provide a lot more um, structure and um, college and career planning for that grade level. And then following that up in later grades. Can I jump in on this slide, Karen? Oh, yep. Can I go back? Yep. So we currently have 24 AP courses. We have 36 dual credit um, offerings. We have 11 CTE programs and 14 current pathways. Um, so even with COVID, we're still providing um, all of those in some capacity. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But we're also providing supports for students because it is open enrollment for AP and dual credit. So offering supports for those students to take those rigorous course, um, course loads through like Juntos and AVID, things like that. One of the things that Karen talked about is that um, systematic, systematic implementation of the ninth grade to transition class because we are actually piloting what's called youth science at the middle um, school between the middle school and the high school. And it's basically an apt to test uncover talents to match students to careers that they'd be interested in. So we'd love to be able to start doing some career planning at the middle level so students can forecast for classes that match possible career interests as they get to the high school, then expand upon that freshman seminar class to include that college and career planning based on the aptitude or interest that the students um, are showing, and then continually to revisit that um, throughout their high school time. So upon graduation, they have a next steps plan to attain that chosen career or that college or technical school or whatever the case may be. Can I ask a question about this, um, that slide? Mm -hmm. Ark, you made it. <laughs> You're muted. You're still muted, Mark. 
I'm sorry, are middle school students able to take high school courses in, in the CTE, any, any of those areas? Uh, we, have, we haven't done that actually, Mark. Um, we haven't uh, transported kids up to the high school to take CTE. Oh, okay. um, we used to do that for some of the advanced like math and stuff like that, but yeah, we haven't. And that some, of the, some of the issue would be just the, the class size and being able to accommodate more kids than what we currently have at the high school. I know that like, for example, in our culinary, um, you know, we have 600 kids that forecast for culinary and we might only be able to offer it to 280 of them or 250. Um, so same thing with woods. So that's a little bit challenging unless um, there's additional staffing. Okay, and there's no way to do it at the middle school. So that's they do what, actually- That's what Colleen's talking about. Oh, they okay. do have some programs down at the middle school that okay. support that are kind of like um, intro classes for like our mechatronics program. They have Aquabots down there. They also have um, a robotics class that's really great at um, getting kids ready for mechatronics. In fact, if they take some of those classes, they can skip over mechatronics one um, at times to be able to go straight into the next um, class. So there is some bridging between the two, but we definitely want to continue um, that, uh, that work with them so that we can get kids more on a career trajectory by the time they get to the high school. Okay, but none of them are for high school credit, even though they can skip a high school class, right? Not yet. Okay. Is that, is there a barrier to doing that? Is there a reluctance to doing that or? Do you know what I mean? You said that they could take a course at the middle school that would allow them to skip a course at the high school. Is, is that, do you know what I mean? I is that, what, wh why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we? That's definitely that? something we could talk about. Yeah. All right. Colleen, I want, this is Narcia, I just wanted to add, um, Dave can probably help me out here too. The uh, Portland Community College um, program, you probably already know what I'm going to say. So I um, used to work there and um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that they're inquiring to work with uh, Forest Grove School District in regards to the TRIO Talent Search Program, which would be ideal for college prep courses starting from the middle school. So I hope I hope they're able to use our data so we can get that grant. Yeah. We've been we've There's been pulling the data for them and we just haven't figured out. I don't think they've responded yet with like, do we still qualify for it? But we've been um, working with them. So I'm hopeful um, that that's gonna come forward for us. Okay, so as we expand and develop our CTE um, offerings, we um, also allow for students to do what's considered a pathway. And so um, in order to be a pathway completer, a student has to complete 2.0 credits in a specific pathway. So um, last year in 2019-20, we had 172 students who completed a pathway. Some of them were able to complete more than one pathway and earn a cord for um, more than one pathway. But you can see on here that um, our Ag Science Department had four people, um, four students who were able to complete at least 2.0 credits. Um, business had 14. These numbers are continuing to um, increase as our offerings continue to increase. But again, we have 11 CTE programs. We have 14 pathways. We also have six programs of study, which is um, students who take 3.0 credits in a given, um, in a given area. Um, our juniors use their transcripts to then forecast for their pathway completions um, last spring. So prior to COVID, we were um, excited for them to get going on um, finishing pathways. Um, but COVID hasn't limited our ability to teach many of our CTE courses. A few of the upper level courses have had to wait for in-person. Um, so these numbers could be impacted for this year's seniors, but we're really hoping that's not the case. And one of the goals in, in, in providing these opportunities is to really make sure that we are recruiting um, underrepresented students um, within those areas. So um, for computer science, for example, um, not, a lot of, not a lot of female students are taking computer science. So um, it's really trying to recruit um, students that don't typically um, take, those, take those classes um, and then lead on to AP classes as well. Hey, quick question. Sorry, Colleen. That's okay. Just a quick question. In terms of, you know, just the data, when you say increase, have we, I know it's a weird time right now with COVID and everything, but have we baseline 
where we are right now in terms of the current numbers, increasing those numbers and, and the target population so we can kind of set a baseline, determine what our goals are gonna be and be able to quantify that. Have we done that or has just been a weird time with COVID? Are you talking specifically with the pathways or participation well, in classes? In classes and in numbers. And when you target, say you're targeting a certain group, mm -hmm. um, do you set goals like that? And then really set some, determine how you're gonna accomplish those goals? Yeah, I guess. Um, uh, Colleen can probably expand on this. Does that makes sense. Yeah, Beth Mullenkamp gives us uh, just a ton of data on um, students that are represented in, in every single one of these classes. That we articulate and so it's it's a big push and it's um you know it's just trying to level the playing field and, and make sure that we there aren't any barriers and if there are barriers then to really figure out what those are so another example would be you know um female students in in metals class okay so and and i mean every high school across the state has had that challenge right so it's interviewing kids it's trying to get an idea of what they perceive the barriers are and then figuring out ways to remove those barriers. We have to do the same thing with our AP classes, right? Because some of our AP classes aren't representative of our student population. So then what can we do to remove those barriers and to provide support for students that might not feel comfortable in those classes? So um, absolutely, um, a lot of data there. We do a lot of um, trying to recruit what, what's considered a non-traditional student into our CTE um, courses and um, non-trad is usually a female um, in terms of some of our CTE. And what is awesome as Karen was just saying that our computer science program, for example, we've had a really hard time, um, you know, trying to increase our numbers of females. And this year we just got noticed or notified today that from our numbers last year, we earned the AP Computer Science Female Diversity Award. We were one of 232 high schools in the country um, to earn that award for expanding female access to AP Computer Science and increasing gender representation. So we're pretty stoked about, about that. And um, just that some of our um, underrepresented students are being able to um, access a lot of our CTE as well as our AP and dual credit courses. Um, and that's really what this slide kind of goes into. Karen kind of spoke to it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so a CTE concentrator is um, somebody who takes at least 1.0 um, of a class um, in any specific pathway. So a pathway completer earns a cord after 2.0 um, credits, but if you are considered a concentrator if you've taken 1.0 credits in any specific pathway. Um, concentrators, according to ODE, are 25% more likely to graduate on time than those who do not take CTE courses. Um, so you can see that 95% of our students who take 1.0 credits um, in any specific pathway are graduating um, on time. 78% um, of our Latino concentrators graduate on time, which is the same as the overall grad rate for our Hispanic and Latino students. And this is where our future planning for ninth grade success is going to come in because we need to identify career goals for all students or plan for college opportunities and then revisit those plans post-graduation, um, for post-graduation each year so that students know what they need to do to accomplish their goals and then work with their counselor to create a schedule of courses to support those goals and aspirations. I have a question, Colleen. Mm -hmm. And Karen might have answered it earlier, so I apologize. You mentioned that uh, hopefully each of the students will be able to work with their counselor to be able to come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. um, do we have enough counselors to do that? Um, I know that the ratio is crazy. It is crazy. We could always use more counselors. <laughs> or is there another? Or is there an idea to hire other people that are non-counselors that could be like, and I think maybe you already have them like coaches or academic coaches or I don't know, just. Yeah, no, you're right, Narcy. And um, the the counselor to student ratio is still um, not where we would want it, um, but it's better. It's a heck of a lot better than it was, you know, several years ago. We were down to three at one time, and and we're up to five caseload counselors. Again, not not an ideal um, ratio, um, but better. And um, yes, ideally, we would we would um, have. Well, if you ask our counseling team, we would have at least one more, if not two, but. Um, yeah, we would like to bring those numbers down a little bit. Yeah, because I'm just, I worry that, how are we going to do that? Yeah. 
Well, and, and that's where we've um, been intentional with some of this money to really hire some of our family outreach, the mental health care coordinator, you know, just making sure that, um, that we're trying to be very, like I said, intentional about surrounding, um, you know, our, our students with um, the supports that they need and then figuring out which supports are, are making the biggest impact and then moving forward from there, right? Because we've never had a mental health care coordinator before, but I tell you, she's rocking it. Um, she's doing an amazing job. And so, you know, um, so now that we see that, we kind of see what's working and then we can move forward um, with, um, you know, a lot more knowledge in, in what, what is having a positive impact with the kids. So, great question. Can I ask a question about the Willamette Promise? It's on this slide. I there, might get to it in my- Oh, I'm um, sorry, okay. <laughs> okay. I bet I know right. what you're gonna ask, Mark. Okay, all right, I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay, so um, this slide, I won't read it to you because you guys can obviously do that, but over $800,000 in credits have been earned over the past two years. Almost 6,000 credits have been earned in the past two years um, through PCC and Willamette Promise. Um, Willamette Promise saw a bit of a de decline this year, um, in our, especially um, because of our Spanish dual credit offerings, which is why um, there are fewer credits earned. Our Spanish dual credit was not possible due to COVID because of the requirements for earning the credit um, last spring. And so um, those courses are back. And um, I know that they've worked really hard with Willamette Promise um, to try and make those accommodations for distance learning. But it does, um, it did cause us to um, lose out on some of those credits that, that students had anticipated. Um, we are also um, increasing our Willamette Promise um, offerings. Our AP Psych um, is going to be offered uh, as dual credit for the first time this year. So that's really exciting. Um, and then most of our CTE courses are actually um, partnered through um, PCC. So a lot of our students who are taking CTE um, courses as dual credit are working with um, PCC and earning PCC credits. Does that answer your question, Mark, a little bit? Yeah, I know. We were kind of bummed out when we saw that too, but COVID. Yeah. So I don't, Colleen, Brian, I'm not sure which one of what I'll, you guys put up on here. So the fourth goal doesn't really have a financial impact in terms of Measure 98, but since it is one of our goals, we thought we'd briefly cover it. But it's just basically that 80% of our PLC meetings with teachers will use student data. Um, and so basically we can, we can, the evidence of that is in our PLC minutes and agendas. The idea is that the teachers should be using PLCs not to plan, but to, to talk about student performance, whether that's the previous summative tests or the current formative assessment that can show how the kids are going to do and talk about best practices. We also have data teams. Um, I'm, I won't spend too much time on this since I think we're running pretty long, but if you have questions, go ahead and ask on that. Okay. The other, other part of the collaboration and using data is the school-wide system of AVID. I think a lot of people think AVID is our two elective classes where we have our AVID students and they're, they're receiving support throughout the four years, but AVID is actually much bigger than that. What it does is it provides a school-wide um, system of instruction of base, best practices, basically using writing, writing inquiry, collaboration, organization, reading uh, skills. And so by, by having teachers that are trained in AVID strategies, it just raises our overall school achievement, our overall school culture. Um, by not, if we don't do that, if we don't provide that training to other teachers, even if they're not doing the AVID elective, what you really end up having is an it, an inequitable access to good instruction, really. And so I think sometimes people question like, why, why are we spending money or why are we sending people to AVID training? It's best practices in teaching and it, it gets everyone using the same language and our results in our AVID programs have been outstanding. Our first graduating class was last year and we'll talk about their, their uh, achievements later. The fifth goal was an 88% grad rate with an increase increase of 10% in special education and mobile student populations. So the additions that came through the funding would be an additional counselor, again, the mental health counselor, the admin, the classified attendance outreach, our aspire mentor. So those are all the things that those, those additions are, you've heard them in other areas, but here's what the, those additions do. So they help us have support conferences every six weeks with, or during this time, it's every four weeks because of our quarter system. 
but we identify kids who have a, uh, the highest number of Fs are going to meet with admin. The next level is going to meet with counselor and the next level is going to be teacher interventions. Uh, we do on track means with every kid who's not on track in terms of credits. So freshman year, that's that six credit mark, sophomore to 12 and junior year, 18 and senior year. So those all have family meetings. Uh, we have uh, EBIS and data team meetings to, to review and refer kids to SPED or 504 plans. Um, you, can, you can read all that. I, I won't go over everything on there. Again, the attendance team is, is key in you know, building that connection with the home. And then again, our mental health court, care coordinator shared with me the, of the 89 referrals she's re received this year. 81% of all those students are in what's called the critical academic risk area, meaning they're failing at least one class. And so having her be able to, to target some mental health care and align those services for the family is crucial for the student, but also for our system because it takes it off the plate of our counselors and those, those kids are getting the help they need. I have one quick question, I promise. Okay. Um, the mental health person you have specialist mm -hmm. is, um, is that person, um, what's, what are their credentials? And the reason I'm asking is to see if there's, now we'll get into the week, but to see if there's an opportunity to have Pacific University be able to, um, depending if, you know, they're a social worker or a clinical psychologist, whatever, we could have some of the Pacific University graduate students possibly, um, have, um, their hours deliver at um, at the high school and provide services to our families and the students. Right. Just a thought. Karen, I, I believe she's clinical. Clinical, is that right? I believe so. And Kim's on here. Um, Kim might be able to actually answer that, but I believe you're right, Brian. And we did have a, a Pacific student last year who helped us, and she was incredible. Uh, did a lot of her social work for us. Former student too. I think, she, I think she might be a licensed professional counselor, but I have to verify that, which is an LPC. Um, so she is licensed to mental health. And I think this is, um, I mean, she's still early in her career, but she's amazing. Mm -hmm. So just, just an idea, planting a seed, um, in particular with our graduate um, Sabiduria program, which is preparing um, Latinx uh, practitioners in the future to help. And they, they're always looking for sites. Great. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. So part of the, the planning with the goal five and the 80% grad rate is to try and, well, I'll just put it quickly and bluntly to try and stop kids from having to go to credit recovery. So the first, if you look at our freshman on track rate and our grad rate, there's a discrepancy there that 75% of your freshmen would be not on track, but 83% of them would graduate like the class of 2020. So we're doing a fairly, well, I think we're doing an outstanding job actually of recovering, but we wanna, we wanna stop that from actually happening, having to get there. So those first lines, there are all interventions that are supposed to help, I shouldn't say supposed to help, that are helping um, students while they're in the classes. So that some, of, some of our support is for the reading workshop to help with, with the English one and English two classes. Our language reading intervention is a targeted reading intervention uh, that goes a little bit uh, before workshop and Daniel Thompson, who's kind of a reading expert and guru runs that. Um, we have an ELD English support class for our, especially for ELD students who are still in ELD classes and are taking an English class for the first time, an English literature class for the first time. Study skills classes and fresh success classes that we are offering. But when we have to consider class size, we can only offer so many of those classes. And so we'd like to get to a point where we can offer more of those classes without having to you know, have it depend on class sizes everywhere else. The uh, freshman everyday algebra and everyday pre-algebra, so daily math for, for ninth graders who are behind in math. Those are all of our um, interventions that we are currently using and constantly tweaking to try and stop kids from having to use credit recovery. The last bullet is that just looking at our tutorials that are in our, for our students with special with uh, disabilities, basically looking at how we're using those and we've changed the structure of those and we've seen some success in, um, in our grad rate with special education students and passing rates. Here's our, our graduation rate history. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but if you look at it, the 2015, our grad rate, our four-year cohort was 71%. This past year, we, we reached 83%. So we've had a 12% gain over the years. Um, the fifth five-year cohort, we generally, we are very interested in our five-year cohort because we have several students who are on a five-year plan, especially if they, because they 
start as newcomers in ELL, they don't, they are, don't have the opportunity to really take an English language arts class until later in their high school year. So they're, it, it's really in their better, best interest to be in a five-year program so that they have time to fully develop the language and also earn a diploma, which will that then allow them to go to PCC or higher because their GPA will be higher and stronger. So that's what the five-year cohort look is. I know some people are saying, I was disappointed honestly to read the paper and people saying that the grad rate increased because of uh, the ODE guidance in the spring. And while that might be true for the state of Oregon, I can assure you that was not the case at the high school. We worked extremely hard at, I told Karen at the beginning of this, that last school year that I thought this would be our best grad rate we had. But what concerned me was that we were starting the year at 90% because we had already lost 10% of our student that, of that cohort. They had moved on and not enrolled in other schools. And so I knew we, so if you think about it that way, the students who enrolled us at the, at the beginning of the year, we did pretty well in that grad rate. And I really attribute that to the relationships that were built for the three and a half years prior to that, or even just their senior year. And um, so that, that grad rate, I think is, a, is, is reflective of that, so. This is the same information, just in a different chart. Um, I don't think we need to spend any time on that one. This shows you our grad rate history just by demographics. It, it, you can see the all students, the 12% jump there. Latinx um, improvement from the 2014-15 has gone up quite a bit to this 80%, a little bit of drop off in the last year or two, 78, but fairly steady. Uh, economic disadvantage has, has had a jump. The one that we, you know, one thing we're proud of this last group is our SPED has jumped up 13%. Remember our goal was 88% with a 10% increase in special education students uh, with special education services. So 13%, we've met that goal. And then we, we definitely know that we need to continue to look at our ELL or our ever English learners and then that grad rate as well. Questions on that? Okay. So this next slide is just, <clears throat> so this, we talk about, um, you know, um, students coming to the high school and just what interventions, what academic supports they need. Um, and this is just um, the class of 2020 that we just talked about um, and that grad rate. Um, this is, this is how they finished eighth grade and came to us. So um, like Brian said, a lot of the everyday algebra or pre-algebra um, we have a, a lot of sections of those. So um, basically with this data, we're taking those 208 kids that were below grade level um, and, provi and providing some academic supports for those and same thing in reading with 158. So um, we're just trying to analyze where students are struggling and what best academic interventions to provide. This is the AVID senior data that um, Brian referred to earlier. So just a reminder to the AVID, um, is for the academic middle. So these students, um, as they went through elementary and middle school, um, weren't necessarily your highest achieving kids. They were the academic middle. And with the supports provided by AVID um, and the AVID tutorial, starting from their freshman year and going all the way through their senior year, this class made some amazing accomplishments. Um, you know, you can see the valedictorian honors diploma um, the GPA, seven Act Six scholarship finalists, um, and then one of those, um, the winner for a full ride, another full ride, um, just some amazing data. And then um, they also dealt with a lot of hardships throughout that. So seven um, were McKinney Vento throughout their four years in high school, um, but AVID um, provides that support. And so using this data and using what we know about um, you know, the AVID um, and Wicker Strategies school-wide, um, making sure that we provide those systems um, for every kid so that they can have um, those barriers removed to accessing anything that they want. So here are some areas that we are continue, continuing to focus on with Measure 98 funds. Um, again, like I just said, some targeted academic interventions and support during the school day. Um, so that's AP, um, Willamette Promise, anything that will, um, anything basically kids want access to, figure out how to support them um, and, and decrease those barriers. Um, grade 9, 10 academic support, specifically in math and language arts, um, so that we don't have um, continued 
high numbers in credit recovery. Uh, so what does that look like and how can we provide um, as, as many number um, uh, supports as, as we need, you know, whether that's 200, 250, um, whatever it is, make sure that we have those in place. And then the ninth grade foundation or transition um, onto um, planning out um, diploma, a career pathway, and even beyond into college. So really making sure that we put those plans in place. And ideally those plans start in middle school, um, but making sure that we have, um, you know, uh, systems in place to not only have those conversations and, and develop those plans in ninth grade, but again, follow up with them in 10th, 11th, or 12th, um, and even beyond. And I don't know if there's any more questions because you asked them as we went along. I just have one. Is there a, is there a, maybe I missed it. Is there a, um, a number of, or a percentage of students who enter and take workshop classes? It might have been in so, an earlier slide or something. So, um, so in math, those are the kids that are in everyday algebra and pre-algebra. And so um, right now that is about 60% of the kids. Okay. Reading has gotten, reading um, has gotten better um, over the years. And so that was, I believe if we go back, I think that was down below 40%, maybe closer to Oh, these, okay, I see. Yeah. So the numbers are there, but it's not like a percentage, right? Yeah, it's or, not really like a percentage. Okay. So you think it's under 40 though? Yeah, well, it looks like it's maybe a little bit above 40. Okay. 45, 48. Karen, for the number, uh, there's a one of the graphs that you showed that uh, I think it was completion. Yeah, that one for the ELL. Uh-huh. Are the interventions that uh, you and your team have been talking about, um, is there any particular specific uh, interventions for this particular population? Yeah, so that um, the English support, well, so what we are finding, um, and, and Brian can chime in too, what we're finding is that um, students um, in our ELD program, um, they would have to double up on their language arts in their junior and senior year, um, which was really, really taxing. And so um, so we've, we've analyzed and adjusted that. Um, we've also got, um, um, some really good, um, teamwork going on in our ELD program. That's, that's really taking a look at each and every kid, um, their progression through ELD, um, use of the ELPA, but also just, um, a lot of their speaking skills. Um, and so they're just, they're just really spending, um, quite a bit of time in analyzing that data. And we're just, we're just trying to figure out where the strengths and weaknesses are of the program and then figuring out how we can, how we can really support the ELD um, students, not only those that are in, but those that have been exited. One of the challenges is that the portfolio exit um, has, has not been um, something we've been able to utilize the last two years, I think it is. Um, so that poses a little bit of a challenge because that ELPA test is extremely extremely rigorous. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I have a question, um, Brian. How do you, uh, you talked about last year's cohort, that feeling you had. How do we feel about this year's cohort right now? Because it, it's just been, uh, well, you, we all know it's been rough. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the question. Are, are we on track this year or do we feel like we're, we're gonna see some differences I think, um, unfortunately, I don't think I don't have a good feeling about it. I, and I had a I had a better command of the class of 2020 because I was their admin all four years. This group is new to me in terms of you know monitoring, tracking them. I've tracked the off track students, but we've had basically two administrators go through with this class, and so now I I am getting them you know here in the middle of distance learning. So what I'm seeing is not good, and I'll. I'll I don't, I would have to look and see who we've lost this year already. And then um, the other thing I'm, I'm, you know, when I talked to Clean and Karen about this is like one of the reasons I feel like that ninth grade careers for all students, which I maybe haven't always been on board with because we're having a really hard time talking some seniors into the idea that the diploma is important at mm -hmm. this point. They're working a lot of hours and they're making, you know, 
pretty good money. Am I still on? I think I just lost hope. I am on. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> My computer went blank. Basically, they're making money and, and we're, we're having to convince them that diploma is important for some of these students. And that shouldn't be a conversation we, we have to have at this point. So it made me think, and we all talked about it, we have to go back to that solid foundation. So that's, not, that's a no-brainer. So what I can do is I can, I have a list of the students that are not on track right now. I just need to look at who the last three years we haven't, we haven't, you know, isn't, isn't enrolled with us and get a better feel and I can update you. But the other thing with the COVID last spring, we were so focused on our, our seniors finishing mm -hmm. and the, the junior at that time, when this, when we're in normal school, I'm usually meeting with all the juniors that are not on track and I'm doing family conferences with them in the spring and talking about summer school and all that. And that was really difficult to have last year when, so that class is feeling it right now, but you know, we're seeing some, some positives and we just got to power through here, but I can give you an update for sure. I'd appreciate that. I, I, I kind of knew the answer. Already. I had a feeling what the answer was going to be, but I'm, so it'd be nice to know kind of where we are compared to where, where we were last year though. Yep. Definitely. Thank you, Ryan. This one last question, Karen, I have some other, I, just a couple, of, and I don't want to take time now to talk about it, but they related to the workshop courses. Can I just email you? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks. And the um, Mark, one thing on the workshop classes, the reading workshop that we um, that we've used for a number of years now, um, we just haven't had um, the FTE to offer as many of those as we have in the past, um, and so. Um, that's one area that we might need to take a look at again with the measure 98 funds is um, some targeted reading intervention more than what we offer now. Okay. Yeah. Those, those reading workshop classes have changed too. They're, they're more the reading intervention, but also support for English freshman English class or, okay. or they're, whereas before they were more tied to Oaks and things like that. So okay. they're more of a support class too. Okay. Well, I think uh, I think we got I think we're wrapped up here. So, um, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, as usual, lots and lots of information there, and and uh, we could probably talk about this for quite some time, but we're always cut short. So, uh, all right, we were told we had twenty minutes. <laughs> we went way over. <laughs> Isn't that how it always is? Oh, well. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. That was uh, was really informative. So thanks very much. We'll uh, uh, we'll close the work session at this point and uh, reconvene in maybe a minute or two. Just probably a minute for the. Or I guess do we go right into the we'll go right into the board meeting now. Uh, yes, thanks, guys. Yeah. From the high school, great presentation. Thank you. Bye, guys. Okay. Are we set to just go into the, okay. All right. Yeah, just call it to order. Got it, got it, okay. All right. Um, the January 25th, to, uh, 2021 Forest Grove School District Board of Directors meeting is called to order at uh, 6.33 p.m. Uh, roll call of board members present, Mark Everett present. Uh, I'm, I'm present, Kate Grandusky. Present. Uh, Valerie Ingram. Present. Narce Rodriguez. Present. And Brad Buffero. Yep, I'm here. And, and then Miley Vernon. Present. Okay, thank you. Uh, the school board will hear public comment for unscheduled public appearance received through the designated email address, which is public comment at fgsdk12.or.us and is on the district website. Comments will be read by district staff at the appropriate time on the agenda and will be limited to three minutes. Um, please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. If we could do a um, introduction of audience and staff now. 
John O'Neill, Assistant Superintendent. David Warner, Communications. Kevin Marine, Human Resources. Enrique, Enrique Pinon, Technology. Kimberly Shearer, Director of Student Services. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. Um, move on to uh, approval of tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for this evening? I move that we approve the agenda for this evening. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? And hearing none, we'll uh, call for the vote. So um, I am a yes. Val? Yes. Uh, Narce? Yes. Kate? Yes. Dad. Yes. Okay, and that motion passes. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, uh, see if we have a student rep report this evening from uh, Miley. I assume that we do. Yeah, it's kind of short though, but basically a lot from the last time is the same right now, but we did work on our senior bests. And so we figured out that it will be sent out in a survey to each senior and it will have a list of senior bests and then they'll fill out who represents that. And then the winners are whoever, yeah, basically winners for each of those categories, they'll get a lawn sign with the title of the senior best on it. And their picture will also be framed and put in the cafeteria with the label of what their senior best was. Um, and then still doing um, is meeting, our cabinet is still meeting every Wednesday. And then next week we'll, we will start our student board meetings. Um, and then for eSports, they're still working on getting the world word out about the spring. And I think they are wrapping up their winter sport season right now. And that's it. Okay, thank you. And I want to, uh, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge that um, Miley and Noe were uh, present at the Washington County um, Legislative Policy Commission meeting which was on a Thursday, I don't know, 10 days ago now or something. And, and they just did a great job speaking on behalf of students, um, high school students. And they spoke to superintendents and other school board members and just, uh, just did a really, really nice job in the meeting. Um, had great insight into, into how kids are, you know, the, the pros and the cons of the uh, CDL. And so uh, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Miley, but also Noe for doing that. So thanks very much for that. Yes, thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Mr. Mr. Parker for calendar recognition superintendent report. Yeah, I think we're gonna start with some celebration correspondence um, kind of thing. And I think Dave and Kathy are gonna lead this. So um, I'll start real quick. We had um, the Neil Armstrong leadership team sent you guys a thank you note and ha they also had masks made for you and I have them in my office. So I'll make sure I get those to you. And it says, Dear Forest Grove School District Board of Directors, happy school board appreciation week. As a thank you for your hard work we and dedication, the Neil Armstrong leadership team has made these masks for you. Thank you. For all you do for our students, school, and community, you are superheroes. Hey, thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, um, another we wanted to do something a little bit different this year um, to showcase some of the, the great work of um, our students. Um, so Kathy and I worked together with uh, the high school art. Uh, department and worked uh, specifically with Glenn Hollinger uh, to identify a few students who would want to do an, uh, an art project to showcase some of their talents and to show 
uh, what, what great work our, our high school art students are doing. Um, so the, the assignment kind of took a, um, it was a metamorphosis from one idea to the next. And we ended up on a really cool project uh, that involved getting a quote from each one of our board members and our students made an art piece out of that. So um, we'll do our best to showcase them through the, the camera, uh, but we will also deliver these to you a little bit later on in person. So let me see if I can bring it up here. I might have to turn off my background here. Give me one second, I apologize about that. Okay, so here's our first one. So each board member chose a, a favorite quote, I'm trying to get that into the camera. So I think these really turned out great. great. Gwen and her students worked really hard on trying to get these taken care of and they're framed. Um, we also will, um, Gwen asked them some writing prompts to, to give you a little bit more background on who they are as a student. This one was done by Ellie uh, Ransman, who's uh, of the class of 2021 and will be going to Linfield College. So that's number one. Thanks, Ellie. It looks great. <laughs> Thanks, David, for sharing. Of course. This is the second one, a um, little bit smaller. Uh, this is was painted by Emily Fan, who's also of the class of 2021, and she is waiting on Ivy League announcement day. Wow. Wow. That's nice. Very nice. Very beautiful. And as that is about libraries, I think that was for Brad, right, Brad? Just kidding, that was for <laughs> Kate there. Um, this one, uh, Narce, maybe you can help me. My Spanish is not very good, but this one is by um, Lauren Miller, who is the class of 2021, and yeah. she'll be attending George Fox University. Yeah. Well, that's actually, yeah, Gloria Saldua, one of my favorite uh, writers. So it's, I'll read it in Spanish and then I'll translate it. Caminante no hay puentes, se hacen al andar. What it means is, um, it's weird to translate, but it's just saying, those of you that walk, the, jo the journey does not have bridges. You have to make the bridges along the way. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thanks, Thanks. Marce. All right, we're almost there. This one is was painted by Azur Rio, who is of the class of 2023. Yeah. All these are really, I think, turned out really cool. Yeah. Okay, and the last one, this one was actually done by Gwen, who is class of 1992. She is the art teacher at, uh, at the high school. Oh, okay. uh, one of the, the students uh, could not, uh, meet the deadline so she picked up the ball and continued to run with it mm -hmm. yeah. so so those are all great. the the quotes that we had done and thought that was turned out really great by uh, some of some very talented uh high school art students yeah yeah and those are great Kim thanks has something to, too okay hold yes, on thanks please. thanks to all the students and thanks to gwen for heading that up great. for us that's really, really nice. nice thank you so much so school board, student services would like to thank you for your commitment to behavioral health and wellness in the district. And we really want to appreciate you for how you've helped us prioritize social emotional needs of students, families, and staff, and also students experiencing disability. And as a token of our appreciation, we have t-shirts that will be available for you. Kathy has them in her office. And they say, all learning is social and emotional with Forest Grove. And they're long sleeves, so that's a bonus. So thank you for all you've done in helping us uh, achieve our goals. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Okay, and I think we're now into the superintendent report, and I'm going to hold most of my comments. My presentation coming up here later is too long to begin with, but I'm going to spend a lot of time kind of letting people know everything that I know right now about um, limited in-person, hybrid, vaccine, and the rest of that. So I'm gonna hold most of those comments for my presentation. But I did just wanna let the board know that the high school principal uh, position because of Karen has retired and we're going to open that up for, um, for competition as our policy, the policy we agreed upon um, says. It opens tomorrow, it'll be open through most of the month. We've met with the school, we'll uh, meet with parents coming up here. And so our process is off and running. 
Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Yep. Right. We'll move on. Um, let's see here. We'll move on to the next portion of the meeting. Um, uh, that's the unscheduled public appearance. Uh, the board appreciates community members sharing information during public comments. Public comments should be submitted through the designated email address and will be read by district staff. Public comments will be limited to three minutes as is the protocol during in-person board meetings. Public criticism or complaints about school district personnel is not allowed at this time. Um, are there any comments that have been received? Uh, yes, we have two, so okay. I can read both of those. Okay, thanks. The first one, um, I don't hear much planning for the summer. In the governor's speech today or last Friday when this was sent, she mentioned that, mentioned that one of the reasons she wants school open is because kids are falling behind even though they are learning in the online model. I have kids in three Forest Grove schools and I'm very happy with the accommodations our teachers have, have made accommodations that our teachers have made. Last, I heard the vaccine for school age kids would be available as early as the fall. If there was a year to try year round school, this would be it. If kids could stick with online school and skip summer camps this year, we could open to kids as they get vaccinated in the fall and as 16 years and older disabled children become available for vaccines, their programs could be opened in person earlier. The hybrid models uh, where teachers need to have kids in person and online seems particularly challenging and maybe not worth it for just a couple months of school. Alden Snow. That's the first one. The second one. Please be advised that my children in grade six at Tom McCall and grade nine at the high school will under no circumstances return to in-person learning during the remainder of the school year. I urge extreme caution in expecting teachers, staff, and students to return during the 2020-2021 school year. I do not feel that we are ready or will be ready to safely re-engage this year. My students will continue to accept the challenges of comprehensive distance learning for the foreseeable future. Thank you for your understanding. Tim and Angela Rudsill. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, David. Um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. This consent agenda is made up of routine non-controversial items to be voted on under one motion. Are there any items within the consent items a board member or the superintendent wishes to discuss separately? Okay, hearing none. Oh, we'll, uh, I'll, go, okay. I'll go ahead and make a motion. Yep. to approve the consent agenda as presented. Oh, I second. second it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, moved and seconded. So um, do a roll call vote. I'm a yes. Kate Grandusky. Yes. Brad Buffero. Yes. Narce Rodriguez. Yes. And Valerie Ingram. Yes. Okay, and that motion passes. We are... Uh, now on to presentations, there's two this evening. Uh, the first is a 2019-2020 audit report. Um, David Bledsoe and Leanne Hurdle from Polly Rogers and Company. Yep, uh, David couldn't join me, so it's just Leanne tonight. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone. Um, um, my name's Leanne and I'm a senior associate with the audit team of Polly Rogers. Um, I know you guys are all busy tonight, so I'll try to make this as quick as possible for you. Um, I will basically be introducing you to the communication of the governing board letter. Um, the letter is basically a summary of the audit that we did. Um, so I'll go over the results, discuss the new um, GASB items that are coming up for the next year and any of our best practices that we recommend and go from any questions from there. Have you guys seen a copy of the board letter? Oh, good. Um, if you guys have a copy, I'm starting on page one of the letter. It has three bullet points. 
that kind of say what the purpose of the purpose of the audit was kind of. And essentially there's standards that we follow and they're the generally accepted accounting procedures. Um, there are also the Oregon municipal audit laws that, and the ODE that we have to apply to and the federal state and other agency rules and regulations that go into the federal awards that you guys get. These are all things we kind of look over and make sure are okay during the audit. Um, if you have it in front of you on page two, um, you'll see the results of the audit, which basically say we gave you a unmodified opinion on the basis of, on the basic financial statements, um, which means it's a clean opinion, no reservations, everything looks fantastic. Um, since there are no material weaknesses or uh, significant deficiencies found on the audit, um, there's no separate uh, management letter that gets issued. Um, and that's important because the uh, secretary of the state requires a response to any weaknesses or deficiencies. Um, but since the district didn't have any, um, you guys don't have to respond to the dis you guys don't have to respond to the secretary of state or fill out any additional findings. Um, Starting on page four of the letter, we have the announcements that may affect your district. All of them were on last year's letter, including the leases, um, accounting for interest costs that incur for construction and the fiduciary activities. Um, they're added onto this year's letter as well because a lot of them got extended due to COVID. Um, they put them off last year um, we haven't heard if they're going to delay them again yet this year because of all the same changes. Um, but we'll let you guys know as soon as we do. Uh, finally, on the bottom of page five of the board letter is our best practice list. Uh, these are merely suggestions on behalf of the firm. Um, it's nothing that the school must do. It's just things that uh, our compliance people and our owner Roy takes a look at and with his years of experience kind of goes, these are kind of areas that could be risky. You may want to keep an eye on them. Um, we don't see any major current issues that are major risks, but we, we want to point out little things for you guys. Uh, there is only three that made it onto your guys' list. A lot of the others were taken care of by your, your team and accountants that you already have. Um, fidelity insurance coverage is something that is on everybody. It's never cost effective to fully cover all the money you have on hand. But we do put it out there um, just so that way the board is aware that there is a little risk there. And if it's brought up and acknowledged and you guys kind of cover it in your meetings and we see that in the meeting notes, then we don't put it on for the next year we know you guys have acknowledged it and are aware of what's going on. Um, 403 compliance requirements is another thing that gets added quite a bit for the majority because uh, education service districts fall into this area. And basically it's just saying um, education service districts do not have service provider reports or internal control reports. Um, so there's always a risk of some things not getting um, reviewed or tested quite as well. But when we do our testing, nothing showed up. There was no holes that we saw at this point, but it's something you always keep in mind and kind of review with them on where things stand and um, how you guys are working well together. The last, oh, and one other thing we always mention on that is um, we have it in the letter that uh, the last line says, uh, if your name on the, if you're on their insurance policy, that would help reduce some of those risks. I went back and double checked my notes and you guys have that already covered. So you guys are one step ahead of me on that one. Um, the last comment we have is the consolidated bank accounts. Um, we noted that you guys have like 34 separate accounts. A lot of them is due to the different funding or the different projects or the different donations you guys have had over the years. 
and just trying to keep track of those. And once you get them started, you tend to want to keep those funds separate from others. But when you're doing audits or trying to manage those, that can make evaluating them a little on the difficult side. So we do recommend condensing those. Uh, your accounting teams already knows it and they do what they can a little bit every time. So I think that'll just be an ongoing note that's always on there until we get it condensed a little bit more. Are there any questions over any of those subjects? Okay, I'd just like to say we really appreciate the opportunity of working with you guys. Um, Eileen and Dustin have been wonderful to work with. Um, and especially with all the challenges of this year with the COVID and all the extra precautions you gotta take with that as well. So thank you for allowing us to come and present. Thanks very much. Thank you, Leon. Very well done. Thank you. Even if I do talk a mile a minute, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Our next presentation is returning to school limited in-person instruction hybrid update from Mr. Parker. Okay. Hang on one sec. Um, while I get there, we are. I lose you when I share my screen. So let me. So today, what I wanted to do is just kind of um, bring everybody up to speed with what we know right now is going on in the state regarding limited in person. Um, some return to in-person instruction, vaccine update. Um, I'm gonna start this, things are changing really quickly. I know we talked, I called all of you on Friday to talk a little bit about the vaccine. Things changed drastically over the weekend. And so this morning we were rapidly trying to get caught up and be ready to um, do our part coming up. So I'm gonna present this, but I'm telling you right now, it's gonna change in, um, in a, just a little while. This first part of it, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about. Um, I sat through a presentation um, about a week ago regarding kind of virus predictions, which is where's this thing gonna go? Where do we think um, the, the number of cases of COVID is gonna be in Washington County coming up? And we heard about an hour long um, presentation by Dr. Peter Graven, who works with OHSU and specifically around um, forecasting kind of where this thing's gonna go. So I wanna present you some of his information. And then I'm gonna also tell you that things are changing even from the time that he presented this. So, but I wanted to give you, this is the best information that I had. So I wanted to give this to, to you. They're tracking, um, and I'll make this presentation available to you. And um, so that if you have questions, you can go back because there's a lot of information here. Basically in tracking, he tracks hospitalized patients because it feel, for them, it felt like a more secure measure. And basically what he's seen over since March um, 12th is basically three kinds of waves. Um, the first one happened in the end of March. The second one happened near the beginning of July. And then this last one happened right at the beginning of um, end of um, November, kind of beginning of December. And so there's been basically three waves that we watched um, go through our state. Um, I, I put this on here, but the only thing that I want you to notice about this is this is just each of the different areas of the state has had a different occurrence with this, right? They have different rates. And um, this blue line here, right in the middle of it, is um, Washington County. And what you'll notice is from about December 1st, we've been kind of, uh, as far as hospital stays, kind of on a downward trend. Not um, uh, other parts of the state that was still going up, but we've been seeing kind of a general downward trend. And then this is just new cases per capita. So we, again, if you look at this, there's kind of, there's a little blip here at the beginning, there's another blip here and then a third kind of three waves that we've seen go through our state here. Um, this was just looking at the number of cases 
um, per capita. But again, just kind of shows the interesting thing here is, is that at the end of this graph is kind of the new data, which is it was coming down. And then within about two weeks ago, we started seeing in the state a general increase in cases. And so then what he presented to us, and I'm going really fast here, but um, what I really want to get to is he started to map out as the state has made an intervention, specifically like um, we closed down everything right in March, right? Well, what began to happen and what, what this curve is basically trying to map is how successful were the interventions? And so as we closed down our state, you could see the, inter the intervention effectiveness started going up. And then people get tired. Um, they, they get tired of, of being careful and being fearful. And so they begin to venture out more. And what you see, what he mapped is basically a um, increase in the um, increase in the COVID and a decrease in the effectiveness. And so what he started mapping out by looking at all the different interventions that the state did, and then looking at how the rates increased or decreased, what he noticed is there's like this um, curve going on, which is, and he, the, Dr. Graven labeled this as kind of the fatigue and fear cycle, which is people would be, as we begin to hear that things are going on, people would be fearful and then began to be very careful about their exposures. And then they would get fatigued and um, you would begin to venture out more. And at that point, we would begin to see our COVID start to take off again. And the reason this was important is because of what he began to map is that basically he's seeing this curve between fatigue and then um, uh, fear. And what he's predicting is, is that our curve is gonna continue to do that basic um, thing, which is we're gonna go in this kind of oscillating curve. So he's using that to kind of make his next prediction about where he thinks COVID's gonna go in our state. And so this is kind of the red dots there, what, what the actual was versus his um, set of calculations. And what you can see here is, is what we're being told from OHSU is they're expecting another bump here. They're expecting another wave out in front of us. He has not worked in kind of the new variants that we're seeing. So that could have an impact here. And then, but mostly he's just mapping this whole kind of fatigue that folks are having around um, COVID. Now, what I can tell you is, is that this, this second curve there used to, was much, much bigger even two weeks ago, which is his forecast was for a much larger wave. And this is coming down. And I wanna bring up where we're at. This is, a, I send this to you every Friday to tell you kind of where we're at. And over the last three or four weeks, we've been kind of trending steady here. I met with Washington County Health this morning and basically what they're telling us is this is now dropping. And so what we're gonna see is this new value is gonna be somewhere around three, might be in the twos, um, 280, 289, something to that extent. I'll have it tomorrow morning is when I'll get my new graph here. But what we're seeing in Washington County right now is, is even though Dr. Graven was um, forecasting another wave, we're not really seeing that wave yet. And now that doesn't mean it can't happen. It's just that we're seeing things begin to kind of um, level or drop off. So it's hard for me right now to kind of know what to say about what might happen. <laughs> um, we're being told that there might be another wave out in front of us, but that's not exactly what we're seeing in our actual data. So as we begin to start talking about what's next, I just wanted to kind of walk through some of the things we're thinking about before we, before we start talking about what these are. First off, our student and staff safety are still our top priority. I'm receiving lots of emails and I'm forwarding them on to you so you can see kind of what our responses are. But no matter what we're doing, we still, that's gonna be our top priority. We're gonna to continue to think about um, uh, our students and, students and um, uh, staff's health. We're gonna be living with this virus into next year. So we're, we are gonna be coming back to school with this virus. So there are things that we're gonna to need to organize and we're gonna to need to figure out. 
the best tools for protecting yourself against the virus are still physical distancing, um, face coverings, and hygiene, um, washing our hands. All of those things are the things that are actually going to um, mean we can keep our school system running while we're um, getting back into school. Um, we've got to have our school staff and our students have to um, take these steps for us to be able to mitigate that risk. So that's just some of the, the general things we're thinking about here. And I think as we go, if you have questions, let's just ask them as we're moving along because of, um, I'm, you know, I'd rather answer it when we're right in the middle of it, if you have it. So here's what we're starting with. We're starting with a measured approach. We're looking for a kind of we're beginning some limited in person. We have um, schools who are presenting plans. It's very limited right now. We're looking at students specifically who are um, uh, not getting their needs met. And that could be um, for several different reasons. And to start with, it's gonna be very small because we gotta to put together the systems for um, our teachers and for students to be able to operate on our schools. The um, county metrics, what we're hearing, um, so the governor in last Friday, two Fridays ago, um, came out and said on the 19th, came out and said that she's making the metrics um, advisory, which means that it's a local school, school district decision now about what you're going to do, how you're going to um, return to in-person instruction. Um, what hasn't changed is um, Ready School Safe Learners, the guidelines that they're expecting us to follow, those really haven't changed very much. So that means that, again, six, um, six feet of space, 35 square feet per, um, per student, um, face masks, um, physical distancing, how, do you, how are we going to um, run our hygiene? All of those things are still in play. So while she's made this advisory, what I can say is really the, the um, the rules by which we need to operate really haven't changed that much. The next thing is, is that what we're hearing is, is that if you're not going to follow the metrics, then they don't believe your liability protection that was passed in the special session in December will um, hold up. So for us, again, I think our idea here would be to still follow the metrics and not go outside of those bounds. Otherwise, we're opening up um, considerable liability for ourselves. Um, there's a lot of, as we begin to um, bring kids back into school, there's a lot of reporting that we're going to need to do. We're setting up the processes for us to be able to do that. Um, we've got to actively work. The idea here and what they've seen in other school districts is that when the metrics are coming down and the test positivity is low enough, you can run your school district with, without introducing, without creating spread within the school you still have spread from the community to the, your students and staff. That's going to happen. But when you have the um, metrics increasing and or the test positivity going up, what they find is when you open schools at that time, you tend to be the spreader um, in your school district. So we'll be looking at, um, again, these metrics. What's the direction of the metrics? Um, what is the test positivity? Um, to kind of make some decisions around when we should begin to open up in a more wholesale way. Again, I already covered this piece, which is our best, our best work is going to be masking physical distance and as we move forward. So as we do this, um, every school will need somebody who's out there, not only the administrator who's in, basically in charge of um, creating the blueprint um, and making sure that the blueprint is rolling, but they'll need somebody in the school also just to be a um, person to go through and make sure that we're upholding those safety requirements. So as part of um, our hiring, we talked about it a while ago, is to increase the number of health um, assistants in the school who can begin to do some of this um, COVID related work for us. There's um, a lot of contact tracing that we will have to do and we're also gonna need help with that. Um, our current folks who are doing that, 
when we start introducing school uh, students back into the school and more staff, it's just going to be a much, much larger job. We've already got protocols to notify our public health. So those parts that I think of those parts of our system are already working fine. Um, I will, we are, schools are beginning to turn in kind of their initial, um, you know, we had this summer, we created blueprints. We now have kind of a shorter guide that gets right at all of the various things that we need them to set up. Um, I'll make sure that the board has access to see some of these, um, some of the school's blueprints. We'll also post them to our web pages, that kind of thing. Limited in person. So we are moving forward with some limited in person in the school district. Um, we've got the high school is working with a um, kind of ELL focused limited in person right now. Our other elementaries um, are kind of creating programs right now. We've seen some limited in person at OGA. They'll, in the beginning of February is when we're kind of pointed at starting some of this work. Um, all the students stay in CDL. This limited in person is meant to be a support, um, bringing kids in to support their work in CDL. So if they don't, it doesn't change kind of what we're doing out in CDL, or maybe it augments what we're doing in um, CDL. It's aimed to meet the needs of specific groups of students based on educational, relational, social, emotional, curricular, um, cohorts of no more than 20 students. Um, and then the time on campus is still two hours or less. So it's not a long time that we're working on right now. And then we'll continue to kind of evolve these health systems as we open, begin to open the schools back up. I did want to mention the advisory metrics. So the health uh, advisory, the reason they did this is um, because there's some science behind this. And while it was kind of, I didn't understand the timing of what they did, what I can say is they based these on the Harvard Global Health Institute. And so there's some science and you'll see that um, Colorado um, Washington have also adopted these same basic metrics. And I'm gonna talk about those metrics in just a second, but there is some science behind why they're doing what they're doing here. Um, like I said, and then the Ready School Safe Learners is basically not changed. As we begin to um, return folks in, we've got to train all of the staff who are in the buildings doing these things on the sections one through three of the RSL the Ready School Safe Learners Guidance. The sheet that we've created is basically that section one through three that they want to make sure that for every school, if you're going to open up to any kids, you've got to have this um, piece. So we'll um, share that with you. We'll continue to provide a comprehensive distance learning model for any student um, who wants to, or parents or family who wants to stay in CDL. Um, so as we're making these transitions, again, we want to leave, make sure that families are comfortable with the decisions that they're making. Um, then we'll work with families to serve all students, even those high-risk populations, whether learning is happening through on-site hybrid or CDL. So the changing guidance, so this is it written out, but I think it's easier. I'm just going to move right to the visual here. So this is the new guidance. And what I want to, um, in the green column, Basically, and the what's important for our district is the top um, top white box um, where it says county case rate um, per hundred thousand over fourteen days. The next box down, county case rate over fourteen days, is really only for smaller districts, so it doesn't even apply to us. And then the third box down, third white box, county test positivity. Those numbers are again; those are valid for our um, district. In the first column in green, with less than 50 cases per 100,000 over 14 days, that's where they want us, they, they believe that we should be operating in school full time. And the science, the Harvard Health um, Institute Science says that operating a school in that green zone means that you can run it and be healthy. You, can, um, you won't necessarily see the spread if you're following the public health guidelines. Then the next column is one that's changed in these new metrics. It used to be 50 to um, 100. 
they've opened it up. It now goes 50 to 200. And in this um, yellow should be where we have K6 is on site, and then we're running hybrids in some of the other areas. The orange um, piece used to be um, 100 to 200. It's now 200 to 350. And our current numbers that I just talked about a little is we were at 332, 339. I think we're now at somewhere around 290. So we're starting, we are now beginning to fall right into this orange um, area where we should begin to look at um, kind of some transition um, towards school. Um, and then again, above 350 is where the state um, would like us to see us. If you're above 350, then you should be moving towards um, CDL. So before I move on, questions about these are the new metrics. Really, it's just the dividing line between yellow and um, orange that's kind of changed there. It's pushed out quite a bit. Okay, um, so as we go in, I wanted to give you a little bit, we, as we're beginning to look at how this looks in a classroom, I wanted the first thing that everybody who comes into our schools, whether in limited in person or whether we start moving towards this hybrid model, everybody's gonna have face coverings. Um, you will wear face coverings at all times unless you're inside of an office, um, without anybody else in that space. Um, we're, we're required to supply those. Our, our um, elementary teachers uh, have a, in teaching explicit phonics, there's parts of that where you have to be able to see um, your lips move. And so at some point during the lessons, there may be um, times where our teachers are gonna have a face shield on and have to take off their mask to perform the phonics part of this. Still working through all of those issues, but just wanted to bring up that that's, a, um, that's out there. Um, again, this is kindergarten and up. Everybody wears a face shield. Um, individuals may remove face coverings while they're working alone in private offices. Here's kind of what 35 square feet in a classroom would look like. So at, um, at the beginning of this, we're going to have room for 15 kids, 11 kids, kind of depends upon the room and the space. But I wanted to give you kind of a visual. Again, we've also got built into these classrooms kind of walking lanes and spaces for, you know, the teachers who have been kind of modeling this have been trying to think through all of the things that they would do in a classroom. Cohorting. Cohorting is still a big, big issue for us. Um, the uh, Currently, students can't be more than any one single cohort of 100 students. Um, at the elementary level, I think that's a very elementary, really K-6, I think that's a very doable thing for us. Once you get over K-6, 7, 12, trying to um, operate within this cohort rule of 100, I think is a very I, it's it's not possible is to operate within this rule that I that I know of. Um, all of our Washington County school systems are spending a lot of time talking about this right now. Vaccines may change um, some of these rules. Again, um, initially the students are not going to be vaccinated, so there's still a lot of challenge for us to make sure that kids are not passing. Um, COVID to each other. So it probably isn't going to change immediately, but that is still a, um, a challenge. Minimizing the number of contacts that staff who work with multiple groups of kids will be another challenge for us. So how do we manage some of our music, PE, library, paraprofessionals, that kind of thing. And then contact tracing. Um, so as the cases in Washington County have um, ramped up to, you know, 100, 250 a day. Washington County has not been able to do the deep kind of contact tracing. They're counting on schools because they can basically have enough people to get to the, to the um, folks who have the COVID to say, hey, who have you been in contact and you need to um, contact those folks. 
For us, what that means is we're gonna have to build in some FTE of people in our organization who will do some of that um, contact tracing for us because we're not gonna get that from Washington County. There's 30,000 students in the metro area. And so there's no way that um, Washington County, Multnomah County and Clackamas County Health Departments can track that many folks. So we'll be working with that. We've already been thinking through kind of some of the FTE increases we may have to, um, to do with that. Transportation. Um, so everybody on a bus will be wearing um, a mask. Um, they're working through the distancing pieces with this. Um, and then the other part is they'll have the windows open so people need to bring coats because they need to keep the um, ventilation moving as um, swiftly as possible. On the school side of this, we're also working on, we're talking through ventilation and what we can do to um, improve that in all of our school buildings too. So that's another thing that I know we'll hear coming up here soon. So before I get to vaccine, just questions on kind of some of the things we've gone through. We're currently beginning to ramp up some lippy. We're still a ways away from um, starting into some sort of hybrid in-person experience. Um, in particular, the vaccine is really one of the limiting factors for that. I'll tell you more about that coming up, but if you've got questions, I could take them on just the material so far. So I have a question, Dave. Um, I, at what point, you know, we talked about, we adopted the five week um, transition, I guess, from, well, I guess from CDL to maybe hybrid yeah, or totally in person. At what point, I mean, it, first of all, is the five week period still something we're going to follow and, and what initiates that five weeks. Can I hold that question, Mark? Um, yep. Cause I think it'll, it becomes uh, super relevant as soon as I finish the vaccine part of this. Okay, okay. Other questions? David, okay. are, David, are you gonna Go send ahead. it to us or have you already? Yes. Okay. I will send it to you. Um, some of the vaccine stuff changed this afternoon. So um, that's, I'll, I would be happy to, and if you have more questions then I'm, I can answer those. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so here's what's going on with the vaccines. Um, again, this has been changing daily right now, it changed over the weekend. Oregon Health Authority and all the major health systems in the area have are developing plans and we've been working with them through our, through our ESD for mass vaccination site at the Portland Convention Center. There's also one at the airport, but basically the, the convention center is the one that they're kind of laying out for educators to get um, vaccinated at. They're scaling this to provide approximately 30,000 educators in the metro area their vaccinations to the site. Now, over the weekend, that changed a little bit with the addition of all the early learning and um, private school um, educators. And so it adds about another 25,000 um, um, folks who need to be vaccinated. So they're rescaling kind of how, how they're going to go about getting this done. The logistics are coming together tomorrow. I will, we will be, we will get an email kind of um, with more details that we will send out to our staff that will kind of lay out how, what process they go through to um, get scheduled for a vaccine. The way this will work is, is that they will, um, the, we identified kind of a set of priorities for folks in the organization to be vaccinated. Then over the weekend, OHA kind of took over that. And they've kind of outlined who they want to get um, um, prioritized. It, it's not a mystery. The, um, it was, the big thing was trying to get our K, um, pre-K through four vaccines earliest, and then probably secondary later, People who are working with kids in Lippy, we're trying to get them into the front of the line because they're already interacting with kids. 
so it, it it's all very logical in what they're wanting. And the key point here is everybody who wants to get vaccinated can, and we will make that happen. But just the amount of vaccine is limiting the um, how and how this is going to happen. Um, the governors stated a week and a half ago, they were gonna start on, I think December um, 25th. I think it's now moving to the 27th. So it's pushed back a couple of days as we're getting organized. Um, the current plan, the original plan had us all educators getting their shots in three weeks. Over the weekend that changed. Now we're still on four weeks though. Um, we'll see. Um, I'm, I'm, that's, that's good. If, I mean, the, the sooner that we can get folks their shots, the better off we are. From first shot to immunity is about 42 days. And so you've got um, 42 days is uh, seven, six, you know, six weeks. So Mark, I think the um, part of the answer to your question about when we might be able to start. I think, yes, I think five weeks is a good time frame for us. And I think um, over the next couple of weeks, looking at how this vaccine rollout goes, we should be able to kind of target, okay, when, when can we be pretty sure that everybody who wants a vaccine can get a vaccine K4? And then start talking about, okay, now how, what model are we coming in and how are we going to open? In the meeting today with Washington County Soups, the basic gist was, I think we're looking um, middle of March right now as being really the first possible time that you could um, vaccinate somebody, go the 42 days and then get there. So um, I'm not sure we're gonna hit that exact mark because of this first week of vaccine I'm, I'm anticipating will be chaotic. Um, as they're trying to get this system down of how folks will drive into Portland, into the convention center and how they will, you know, we've got to get all of their logistics all set. But that gives you kind of an indication of where we're at. And I think hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we will know like how this vaccine rollout is going. So the other wild card here is um, the federal government's promised 100 million vac vaccinations in 100 days. Um, there's a third um, vaccine that will also get approved. I, I should get approved, um, the Johnson & Johnson. It's a one-shot um, dose. We're hearing some good encouraging things to begin with. If that one also comes on board, that should actually speed up a lot of stuff for us. Um, Tomorrow, I mean, our first teachers can have an opportunity to get vaccinated on Wednesday. Um, I don't have the directions yet. So, I mean, we're still waiting for that to come out of OHA. As soon as we get those tomorrow, we'll be giving that to our teachers to begin scheduling themselves in for, um, for the, so it's, it's going. Um, there's just still lots of um, chaotic things about it. And that's everything I know right now and where we're at. Um, lots of decisions still out in front of us as far as kind of this hybrid model. And, but I still think the five week time we have, I don't think we've started that five week yet, but I think we're getting closer to being able to kind of know, okay, here's where we're gonna aim for. Hi, Dave. Thanks for sharing this presentation. There's some, some hope. I was wondering what we're going to do um, about staff who does not want to be vaccinated. So we're still talking through this um, with our, our union groups. This will be part of the working conditions. But here's the basic gist, which is we're not going to mandate um, that everybody has to take a vaccine. But at some point, we're gonna need our teachers in the building because of without it, we're not gonna have, class sizes are gonna increase. So there's a point here where we're gonna say you have to report and you can report unvaccinated and mask up and stay, um, you know, keep you know, physical distance and do the other public health things. 
Um, you could, uh, there's, we still, if you're a person of high risk or something, you would meet with us in what they call an interactive process. And we would talk through whether or not we could accommodate your, your situation. We already do that with lots of different health related um, things right now. You would use that same process. Um, or you have to take applicable leave or you could resign. I mean, I don't mean to be um, harsh with that. It's just that there is a reality here that we, at some point we've got to run school again. And if you're not vaccinated, there's only a limited number of choices. Now, I still have to bargain that with the union. So that may, there may be some things that change slightly, but I don't, I think those are, those are the pretty standard kinds of things out there. Yeah, that, that seems, pretty, pretty fair to me. Um, I've heard other cases where people haven't wanted to have the vaccine and they might work at a doctor's office or, or something of the sort. They just have them sign a liability waiver. So I don't know if that's something you need to talk to the union or Brian Hungerford about, but it may be not sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if we would be liable, but I think it's something that should, we should think about. I don't think we're liable because of the legislation was, that was passed, but I'll write that down and we'll check in and make sure that I'm, I'm not sure where we're at on that yet, but at some okay. point we are going to have to um, deal with that. Okay. Thanks. Dave, um, when do the teachers go to get this vaccine? Is it during their working day or is it after school or in the evening? So we're working on those details right now, but it basically runs um, all day and into the evening is when this session will be open. But I'm going to hold on describing it right now, Kate, just because I've talked to a couple of our union folks about it. But um, I, what I want to assure you is we're going to be, we want people to um, get vaccinated. That's, that's the quickest way for us to get back to school. So we're working really hard to create a really fair situation for that to happen. But I don't want to announce it at the board meeting before I've had my um, conversations. Yeah, um, I, I've heard from some teachers that have been concerned that they would have to take a half a day off or that they would um, have to use their personal leave. Um, and, um, you know, concerns about uh, who takes over their classroom because if they have to sign up for an appointment, um, you know, can some of this um, government money be used so they don't have to take their personal leave? So I'm sure that you're talking to the union all about that, but I, um, yeah. and I know that you will work with them, but the, the big issue is to make sure everybody gets vaccinated. Yes, and those are exactly the issues we're working through and we will create a very fair, fair thing. So, because again, we wanna pull the barriers out so people go get vaccinated. I guess I just have one one question, David. <clears throat> Are we in line with the other districts around us <clears throat> in terms of process and kind of? The, I mean, are we having? Are you having the same discussions with them about where they are and what their plans are? So we're all kind of moving and in the same direction. Yes, and in particular, I meet with we meet weekly right now. It's just been too much, and probably more than that. Um, they pulled together a separate group of our people to work on the vaccine logistics part. So Kevin Noreen has been meeting with other folks from other districts to kind of talk through that. Um, we are on scale. What you will have noticed, there were two school districts that announced that they were going to open um, February, whatever. Both of them have now rescinded. Um, both um, the Redmond School District and Lake Oswego both said they cannot meet that deadline. And the reason has to do with kind of, we need access to our whole staff. And we, we're not gonna have that until we walk through this vaccine piece. Um, so the other school district, I was just talking to them today, they're all looking at the same basic thing, which is um, the time with which it's gonna take our K-4, pre-K through four, um, to get through their two vaccinations is really the, really the time that we can look at pulling back more kids to school. And we're all looking at this 
six weeks away from when we can actually start getting this thing going. So I talked to all of them, Tiger Twalton, um, Hillsborough, Beaverton are all in the same basic um, piece. The, the models we're looking at are um, similar. So um, yes. Thank you. I think, I think that's a smart move in terms of just making sure that people are kind of moving in the same direction. So we don't have, I just think it's a good idea. So thanks. I think that might be it, Dave. I, I, I think we have one thing. Okay. I think we have the kindergarten computer refresh. Yeah. Well, I meant for your for your portion here. For me, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not really it, Dave. I, I know it, it's going to go on, but I mean, for now, for tonight, right? Okay. Yeah. So thanks very much. Um, okay, we do have one more uh, one more thing to. Uh, uh, address this evening and that is an action item that has to do with um, kindergarten computer refresh and uh, this is presented by uh, Enrique Pignon. Uh, thank you Chair Everett. Um, the action item that's before you today uh, for the board is back in August uh, the school board approved uh, the kindergarten device refresh and the district went ahead and, and made a purchase um, of those devices uh, for the kindergartners. Unfortunately, with uh, COVID uh, and a few other uh, things that were going on with uh, tariffs and just supply and demand with everyone in the world needing devices and kind of different delays with Intel and Glass, the devices which were originally we were told would be available and to us by December, uh, we just heard that they won't be available until at least May. Uh, so in speaking to the elementary principals and the kindergarten teachers, and especially now with the metrics looking like we are in a, a position where we might start changing into hybrid uh, and discussing things with the business office, we felt it was uh, important to go ahead and try to find a vendor that could get us the devices uh, sooner. So we would be better positioned to already have these devices ready, especially uh, moving into hybrid. So we did find that uh, devices that previously were not going to be available to us from Dell, which is actually the same device that's currently in district they can get to us at least right now they're saying uh, get to us uh, in by february so we can have them and uh, possibly have them ready for kindergarten uh, starting into hybrid so uh, the action item before you today is that we recommend the board to cancel the original purchase that we made uh, that the board originally approved back in august uh, and approve that we uh, basically reorder uh, process a new purchase uh, from dell the previous order had been through cdwg same dollar amount, Enrique? Uh, actually, that one, what we did is uh, in talking to Eileen, uh, looking in some enrollment forecasts and also looking at devices that we may need to replace uh, and kind of positioning ourselves for the things that always come up where we may need some more devices. We increased the amount. It was previously going to be an order of 420 devices. We changed it to 450. Uh, and prices have changed from when we originally placed the order in August. So prices have gone up. So the original order for 420 was for 117,000. Uh, this order for 450 uh, is up for 141,000. Uh, the funding for this is coming out of the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. So it's coming out of the ESSER grant. Okay. Want me to make a motion, Mark? Yeah, do we do uh, two, uh, Kathy, or do we just do one? I think you can do one motion that says to cancel and cancel and then yeah okay Re right. redo it with Dell. Sure, go ahead, Brad. So I move that we cancel the original kindergarten computer refresh um, order, and I move that we accept the new order kindergarten computer refresh as described by Enrique tonight. Okay, I'll second that. Any discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Uh, Val? Yes. Narce? Yes. Kate? Yes. Uh, Brad? Yes. 
and I'm a yes. So that motion passes. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you. And um, let's see, we have uh, future board items or board discussion. There's, um, I don't know if there's any, any uh, changes or updates or any discussion, updates to the future action items or any discussion. Okay. I think uh, hearing none, we will We'll adjourn and uh, we'll adjourn this school board meeting. It is uh, 7.39 p.m. So thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Good night. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.